So when you uh, got into psychedelics, what were, I mean, what were your experiences like? Because like I said, I've, I've only microdosed uh, psilocybin, and that's um, 100 to 300 milligrams of psilocybin. It's, just, it's so small, right? right you, there's no yeah, hallucinatory effects at all. Um, so I've never tripped on mushrooms. So what, you know, my experience compared to your experience is completely different. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. So um, when I was in my 20s, I started to really get into uh, about the time I went to China twice. So I was really interested in Taoism and, and Chinese forms of Buddhism. And so went there to study Mandarin at a university. And um, around that time, I was also getting interested in psychedelics, particularly listening to a lot of Terrence McKenna and, and Robert Anton Wilson, Timothy Leary. And so my approach to psychedelics was not a um, a medically oriented process. It was it was purely for the purposes of what I perceive to be the leading frontier of the religious phenomenon. Uh, because me, I study religion. That's what I do, and so I perceive myself as being a sort of um, in the in the very leading edge of the historical enterprise of trying to understand what's going on and that these psychedelic substances were not only the origin and source of what religion comes from, but then now in the 20th and 21st century is going to be the doorway back to a sort of utopia. That was my perception. And so um, yeah. I went really hardcore. So I'm talking anywhere between the sort of uh, five grams in silent darkness up to five to eight grams of psilocybin. Uh, you know, anywhere between two to 10 hits of acid, uh, liquid acid, gel tablets, uh, going to raves, smoking DMT as much as I can get my hands on. Um, so I went into, I, I was interested in going into the deepest waters possible, uh, because I thought that the deeper I went, the more of a sort of connecting of dots, or maybe from a Buddhist context, a sort of minor Satori experience I would have. And I felt like when I came out, then I could piece things more and more together. And uh, I was pretty intent on that for multiple years. And it wasn't until uh, at the end of my master's degree that one of my DMT experiences and LSD experiences, what I believed was about to happen in my life and, and all this insight and, and gnosis, this knowledge that I was acquiring, uh, didn't come true. And that slowly sort of caused a fracture in this idea that the psychedelic experiences I was having, which was a totalizing uh, understanding of my reality, wasn't actually matching on then to his, you know, reality itself that I'm having to deal with and get a job and do X, Y, Z. So what was that um, specific thing? Go ahead. Don't mind. What was that specific thing that didn't happen like you had envisioned? <clears throat> yeah. So oh, I took man. a, I smoked DMT one time during my master's degree and uh, had a very vivid experience. Um, one was a sort of like a 1950s diner and the wall was a sort of spinning galaxy and uh, the archetype of the time traveler. I don't know if you're familiar with that. If you were to put that in a search engine, you would see that it would be a, a sort of man with a top hat dressed in a two piece, maybe a three piece suit with a briefcase or something. And it's a sort of anonymous face, but this sort of business-like 1920s figure um, is a sort of archetype for the time traveler. And when I was in this diner, uh, that's the type of people that were coming in and out of this sort of spinning galaxy on the wall. And I was sitting there and it was very, very real. And then uh, from there, it took me to this sort of uh, like visual, uh, sort of emotional uh, cognitive realization that I was going to get into the University of Chicago for my PhD in religious studies. And the University of Chicago, generally speaking, is considered like the top university for religious studies. University of Chicago is the first place you had the field of religious studies. And that's where the, the world religions fair occurred in like the end of the 19th century. Um, so um, I was in at the University of Illinois, had this experience and uh was totally convinced that i was going to get it now <clears throat> i applied didn't even apply to some of these other schools didn't get in um and had to eventually go sell cars for a year and then got into berkeley uh, the gtu the graduate theological union where um i was wanting to do research on people who claim to be spiritual but not religious and and why they appropriated certain religious symbols why buddha heads why ganesha why 
Christ or Christ conscious. So that's what initially what I went and I was a non-believer at the time. That then led to my first semester doing research on a book called The Psychedelic Gospels, which is interested in evidence of Amanita muscaria and various psilocybin type mushroom frescoes present within southern France, Germany, northern Italy, um, <clears throat> and uh, Turkey. And the author was making the claim that this was the sort of secret uh, Eucharist of the Christian tradition and that the sort of sacramental wine and bread uh, was a sober, false Eucharistic uh, tradition. And so I was a non-believer, very much interested in psychedelics, had a YouTube channel, a thriving YouTube channel, promoting all that stuff. And I dove into it and realized that all the evidence was obviously historically contextualized. It all existed between the 900s and the 1300s. And a deeper research led to me realizing that uh, a group called the Cathars, um, which was a, a Gnostic heresy that emerged during this time, during the medieval period, right in that area. Um, and then even during the Inquisition, when the sort of uh, killing of the Albigensians, these were a sort of Cathar community. Um, so the Inquisition was a way to sort of put down this stuff. And that's why you don't see it after the 1300s, because things like the leader of the Knights Templar was killed right in the first uh, in the first decade of the 14th century, so the 1300s there. And that's what eventually led, side note, but led then uh, the Templars ending, moving north and establishing itself as Scottish Freemasonry. And so you see that then emerge within that later half of the 14th century into the 15th century. Anyways, that's a digression, but the um, looking into good, um, the psychedelic gospels led to uh, this research and looking at these sort of Gnostic heresies, which then has led into further uh, research of myself, looking into the use of mushrooms within Gnosticism. And so John Macro Allegro, the famous uh, linguist dealing with some of the dead languages around the Mediterranean, made the claim in uh, the sacred cross and the mushroom that Jesus Christ himself was a mushroom. Now, uh, nobody has came and validated that that book. And so it's still sort of a mantra amongst the psychedelic community to always reference right. John Marco Allegro and Christ was a mushroom, even though at this point, 21st century biblical scholarship, many non-believers now, the majority of atheist scholars agree that Jesus of Nazareth was a historical person, that Christianity right. was founded uh, on this, but they don't believe he was God. They don't believe in the miracles and all this different stuff. They think this was just the, the, the explanation because that's what the evidence points for. And so there's been nobody regarding, uh, and John Michael Allegra was a Dead Sea Scrolls scholar, but everybody kind of condemned him when he came out with this book. Um, but that's still, again, a mantra, uh, the immortality keys, basically, of the same idea. Um, and that that book is, uh, in my opinion, as an academic, a real joke um, to, to take seriously this talking about multiple religious traditions. The nuance there is just uh, not not there, not there at all. Um, but looking into these Gnostic traditions, um, I do believe that they were using psychedelics as the Eucharist. And I've, in other research uh, I've done for, uh, for my program, looked at Hippolytus and Irenaeus and looking at a lot of these early church fathers talking about the Gnostics. And you do find absolutely instances of them drinking certain potions for inebriating intoxications, for certain rituals, for group sex, um, and um, this is known amongst the you know various Gnostic groups. So my conclusion then came that maybe in in the East and Russia, because there's books, for example, from R. Gordon Wasson and his wife uh, um, <clears throat> Valentina Pavlovna, they wrote a book called Russia Mushrooms in History, or Russia History and Mushrooms, or something like that. But um, it talks about the linguistic connection of Slavic languages. Um, to uh, mushroom picking, or they would call it, it was a mushroom philic condition, uh, 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 culture. So Slavic mm -hmm. cultures, generally speaking, it's not uncommon for grandmothers to take their granddaughters to the woods to pick wild mushrooms, tell them which species, what, what type of uh, cuisines to cook it with, and all this different stuff. And so they have tons of words for mushrooms. Uh, whereas in English, um, you do not find that. However, in, in French and Italian, you do find many more words for mushrooms than say in German or English. Um, anyways, that obviously relates to some of the fresco stuff, but um, the 
book, Russia, Mushrooms in History, uh, showed that Slavic languages ha are much more, uh, you know, mushroom philic. So I thought, oh, well, if I go look at the Eastern Orthodox Church and theology, I bet in their iconography, I'll find more evidence of the mushroom frescoes I found in these Gnostic communities in Western Europe. Fast forward, I then learn about church history. I then learn about the theology and I already had a background in philosophy. So then learning about what I call and what really what I do now and why we're having this conversation is due to my now newer YouTube channel called Church of the Eternal Logos, where I use the Logos theology of Eastern Orthodoxy then to analyze and talk about various topics uh, or current events and stuff like that. So fast forward, took that class, learned that theology was a non-believer and then slowly but surely Diving deeper into that reality, uh, eventually my heart was converted along with my mind. And uh, by the end of night of 2018, uh, on 11, 11, 18, I, I gave my life to Christ and uh, um, been Eastern Orthodox or at least pursuing that and then eventually got brought into the church. So uh, long roundabout story, but I'm yeah, sure anybody I love it, dude. that's going to give a little it. bit more of a context of how I know so much about all this mushrooms and psychedelic stuff and how it relates to Christianity.